I'd like to introduce Henning Dietrich, uh, who's sitting in Berlin from Lexon.tech. He's going to be talking to us about human readable smart contracts and how it compares to Monax, a, uh, you know, the guys that used to be Eris that started out in that area. And uh, if 10% of what he has, he's going to talk to us about is working, then we're all pretty stunned. So take it away, Henning. Yeah, Excel Surfer. I mean, you, you said that with Monax, um, but uh, there is something to that. Uh, there is, and I'm sure you're going to be stunned. Uh, so, and that's actually a tab I should be calling up the GitHub where the open source stuff is. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen and um, uh, get jump right into the presentation. Uh, maybe maybe one or two words before uh, about me. So I've been I'm I'm certainly. On the, on the programming side of things. Uh, I've been a freelance programmer most of my life. Also did uh, stints that were very interesting at IBM, at the Boston Consulting Group. I happened to be the first um, architect of uh, Hyperledger, which now Hyperledger Fabric, which was then basically IBM of blockchain. Um, and for a while, I was kind of the liaison between the Ethereum world in Berlin and uh, the IBM developers. So. Um, I had a life before blockchain, which was actually um, uh, databases. Um, I, I worked, uh, I also did open source stuff for um, high velocity databases, um, big data databases, the, mice, the NoSQL stuff that came up at that point. And that was obviously, um, I, I did tests with uh, consensus mechanisms, uh, traditional Byzantine for uh, consensus, Kafka, Zookeeper. Um, and, and spinning up nodes at AWS uh, and, and uh, creating uh, stuff there that was just trying to find out how fast you can, how many transactions you can do. And of course, you were, we were talking about millions of transactions at that point, right? It was a high velocity database. Um, and I also created a language before um, for the insurance industry. Again, nothing to do with blockchain. Um, but it was a very exciting uh, project that I, um, and I kept coming back to that uh, topic. It was basically a bespoke virtual machine. It was all about, it was not so much about the language, more about what the virtual machine could do. And um, it's actually also what excited me um, about blockchain or rather Bitcoin. It was a script. It was the, the, the tiny virtual machine that exists within Bitcoin uh, that not many, many people care about or do have to care about but that, that was Vitalik, that vitalik wanted to expand upon and and build ethereum on bitcoin with and everybody went uh oh, go away <laughs> i don't know everyone went go away I mean, for sure we didn't um at that point i was uh, actually i was working in um in uh mobile payment we were i was working with gustav simonson and uh, we started to do Bitcoin, like half an hour of Bitcoin every morning to keep our sanity because those protocols and interfaces are so sick. Uh, how you how you do the credit card um, billing uh, uh, at the back end. And I remember um, how we when we looked into the stuff, and uh, that was right when the Ethereum paper came out, and we were super excited. Um, and and followed that pretty closely. But you know um, you are then. Platza in in Berlin, no doubt. So you know Jörg Platzer, Jörg Platzer from Room Seventy Seven. You of, of course, yeah, Jörg. Sorry, yes. No, I mean that's where we were. I think that's actually where we in two thousand fourteen we were uh, creating uh, our Bitcoin startup about um, about uh, the. World Championship, Football World Championship, uh, eviction market basically, and sitting in room seventy-seven. So, and that's where we actually worked. So, and I was I was obviously very excited. I had also a background in functional programming languages, so and that comes to bear at a layer. Um, and to me, it was also quite obvious from the start that was what Vitalik was doing was basically using a very Python mindset in uh, extending what. Uh, uh, what those little uh, transactions could actually do, right? A lot of stuff was like the, the, the thing that I intuitively probably regretted the most was uh, doing away with UTXO because that was such a uh, elegant, it was, it was so awesome, right? And, and Ethereum, which is basically 
tone that back down to something um, that would hopefully be simpler to think about, which might in the end not even be the case, but it's obvious why certain decisions were made. And meanwhile, we have a lot of blockchains that try it differently, right? That have a more functional uh, viewpoint and, um, and propose different types of um, languages that are um, doing it a little bit different and are, that are basically just less informed by an object-oriented thinking. What I want to propose well, let here. Me ask you, let me ask you a question. So, are yeah, you sure. are you are you a Lisp guy? Somewhere back no, in. No, I'm not. Actually, I did Lisp like, uh, like I don't know, almost. I mean, <laughs> for it's it's so long ago, but um, I can't tell you why um, I never really became a Lisp guy. Um, but I'm certainly. Uh, I, I even remember when I first heard of Prolog, I basically decided this can't work. <laughs> it was just like, I must be, I must be stupid because how would you implement that on the machine uh, level, right? So because Prolog is just so abstract that, and I'm really talking about, you know, uh, the very first dabbling in, in program languages and so on. And uh, I actually, funny enough, the language that I really loved, uh, really fell in love with was fourth. And of course, <laughs> that is pretty much how Bitcoin works, right? It's a it's almost a little fourth uh, toned down fourth machine. What's what's uh, built into Bitcoin? Where I want to go though is that what I want to propose today is on the far end of the other side of the spectrum, where um, the thinking basically is: how can we include people who are not programmers and and fix that missing link in the trustless idea, where at this point, everything's trustless, except everybody has to tr trust the programmers that they actually programmed in the smart contracts what you, what you hope they programmed, right? <laughs> because we can't read smart contracts. Well, it's not that trustless, right? And that's fair because- Things, are gotten, things have gotten a much, much more readable though. I mean, we have to admit that, that from, from where it started to where it is we're now, you know, we are we are having much more of a of readability in in the in the modules and stuff. But I understand that you want to go uh, go at it at a deeper level. And I, I think it's a great, a great interjection that you make there because more readable for programmers, yes. But on the journey I went, I understood how non-programmers look at code and how much we are taking for granted that just absolutely isn't. And you can almost be sure that like. The vision for Lexon um, uh, has, from the start, been: Can we create something that is actually a program, but that so doesn't read like a program, and you have to explain so little or maybe nothing about it, that a judge is going to take it as a agreement that they're going to cast an opinion about? That was from the start the objective, and actually, I must say, it turned out to be more possible than I thought. I thought you always have to have a learning curve. You always have to learn something, but it turned out that that's actually maybe not necessarily the case. And I, I'm going to jump in now and 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 show you guys uh, how I mean that. Um, so, the mission of Lexon is um, to have human readable smart contracts. They should also be curable, but I would I will not talk about that too much. That's another part that has to be part of it, and that's where my virtual machine building. Uh, side comes in, but we're only going to look at the language here now. The idea is really that um, there is a lot um, that is going on right now where you can extend what you can use smart contracts for into areas where right now people don't even think about because the separation between programming and normal business or normal interaction between people is just something that everybody feels like that's a given, right? So in a way, sometimes I, I have to start and say, okay, let's think far into the future, right? Let's not think the next years even, or maybe in the next 10 years, or at Sandy Pentland laughing about me, um, about that my, the, my vision is that judges are going to look at smart contracts, right? And it doesn't matter, right? Maybe it's 10 years out, maybe it's 20 years out, maybe it's not that far out though, because maybe some things are gonna change right now, right? But if you think about trust, right? If it's something that really is important to people that you want to propose to people, like the contract for the house, 
stuff like this, right? People will want to read it. And it doesn't have to be ex as extreme as going to crypto sleep. Yes, then you also maybe want to see <laughs> what the conditions are, Creo, um, how you will that, uh, is that Creo, wake up or not. Is that Creo sli sleep or crypto sleep? Cryo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I said crypto sleep. That was wrong. Cryo sleep. So the idea is that uh, traveling to distant, ga distant galaxies, right? Um, you will, of course, be um, frozen and uh, hopefully woken up later. The point here is just something that really matters to people. They will want to have as much insight as they can. And it's asking quite a lot as programmers that they trust us that we got it right, especially because very often we don't get it right. And we sunk hundreds of millions in crypto meanwhile, right? So hundreds, humans will always have a role. And smart contracts and humans are not, I think, mutually exclusive, right? It's not necessarily about saying, okay, we're going to replace all functions that right now we trust humans, we were going to replace them with contracts. But if we really think ahead, like what the, the, the big changes that are that are coming, right? It doesn't even matter what it is, right? Is artificial intelligence really going to play the huge role that, um, that some optimists are thinking? Are we going to drift right into post-scarcity? Because right now, a lot of people think <laughs> the funniest thing I heard is that a lot of people who are doing home office now who always suspected that their work can actually be done in the, the whole week's load of work can actually be done in two hours without all the overhead in the office. They find out now they it's true. <laughs> what they usually do in a week, they can actually do in two hours, they find out. And I'm really curious to see how much we're going to go back to the ordinary office setting or how much we're going to learn out of, uh, out of what's happening today, right? So what what we are what we want though basically is that we want to make some things more driven by algorithms than in the moment being manual in the moment having huge overhead um in the web space that actually is not really helping you're actually probably degrading people uh in in a certain sense uh, to, to letting them do what what computers can do much better and this is actually a thought it goes back to 1666 or something when uh, computer sciences was basically starting, where from the beginning the idea was okay, let's do let's machine do the chores, right? Can can't we liberate um, people to do something, um, something creative or something that's that's actually uh, worth their time and do the let the machines do it, but. When we, when we go and head and, and merge those two worlds, right? If we go ahead and say, okay, not just us programmers who are kind of on the, on, the, on the nerdy side, on the scientific side, but if we ask people to actually come in and trust the blockchain, trust smart contracts. And if we want to put more and more um, important functions on the blockchain that might not be mutable and I'm, I'm super excited I was from from day one basically to see what will happen when smart contracts start to show emergent behavior when more and more they start to interact with each other and of course it's going to be horrible stuff like flash crashes and what whatnot but not just on the stock exchange with something something important but the more we want to push it towards that and I think the future is there uh, we must be able to understand the code and we not just the programmers but we must also be able to share the, the vetting of the code and be able to draw in other experts to look at the code because otherwise we will just have a new kind of recentralization where the trustless motto that, that actually is, is driving a lot of decentralization is in a way, again, a centralized function of experts being able, um, like a new priest class um, to, um, to, to read the code, to write the code, to take uh, some money left or right, to write the code leaning more in this direction or in another direction. Didn't, uh, that was what William Burton was exploring in Mona Lisa Overdrive, where the, uh, the legal entity AIs were up in foam space and, and were iterating through contract languages that were ununderstandable by the vast majority of the population, which allowed them to maintain their their wealth and and perpetuate their existence right it's that it's exactly. that exactly it's yeah. and it's not a minor thing it's not a minor thing and i think um i don't have a slide for that in this in this deck but um uh later when i when i'm going to show the book um there's a robot on it and i think 
we are on the threshold now where we have to somehow as a society start to have a discussion about what machines should be able to do and what the limits are. Those classic Asimov robot laws, right? And I'll come back to that later, but that is where maybe the most important function of this language that I'm going to show lies. In the end, what we're talking about here, it all boils down to rules, right? And if we think about rules, especially in the context of smart contracts, um, we can look at different layers, right? At the top, you have the constitution, the founding fathers in America did that, and um, uh, the Brits still don't have it. Uh, there were revolutions to, to get one. Then underneath that, you have the actual laws, right? And the, the main problem with laws, of course, is that everybody is asked to uh, abide by them, but there are bookshelves full of books of laws now, and nobody even has the idea that anybody walking the earth has read all the laws that in theory though applies to every, every single person, right? Though your lifetime death is not enough to read all of them. So we have created a legacy system here that obviously can't really work, right? It's, it can't really be fair. You have to pay um, people to, to navigate it for you. And even they have as a normal excuse that, well, they can possibly know all of it, right? And much of their work is research and all of that. Underneath that, you have a more accessible layer, and that's regulations, right? They are more concrete than laws. They have actual numbers, and you can make fun of them, like a banana has to be curved like this and be big like that, or otherwise it's not a banana or cannot be imported to the European Union, whatever, yeah. But there's tons of regulations, and there's even more regulations than law. And I and one of my, my assignments was to the European Commission, who after 2008 went into panic mode, and issued a hundred laws, like I think 156 different laws for banks to abide to. And they were actually looking at blockchain because the European Commission guys understood that actually they had gone too far. They had created a jungle of laws that they ex expected the banks to buy to, but it was, there was just no way to, to find a way to still do business and abide to all these laws. And these laws had then actually been uh, implemented or made, made concrete in 500 something different regulations because they are basically- I can offer, basically I can offer the a personal story about that. My, my uh, <laughs> ex-wife works for the Bankenaufsichtsrat in, in Austria. And I've asked mm -hmm. her numerous times, so like, do you guys have a clue what it is that you're implementing with the banks? And she's like, we don't have a clue. <laughs> None yeah, of us has an overview. Because they don't, yeah. And at that points you to another completely dysfunctional section. It's just because we're so used that things are like they are, we're not really, we're not really expecting any, anything to change there, right? But this is why I had the slide in the beginning. If we want to go to Mars at some point or out of our galaxy or whatever, let's think far into the future. It's obvious that this is ripe for disruption, right? And smart contracts like we know them now don't really cut it yet. And why? if smart contracts were human readable, would cut it. That's something that takes a real long time for people to sink in. And this is why I think the time horizon here is, is really a little, a little wider, right? But it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it is, in my view, for sure the direction where we're going because we can go there and because we will, as a society, benefit hugely from going there. Just to, to end the discussion of this slide, the point here is, the lowest level are contracts. That's kind of private law, right? And that's, that's the rules that you're creating in your interaction with other people. They can be implicit. Most of them are implicit. They can be explicit if you really do a business contract or businesses deal with each other. Most of it is spelled out. And there is, there's a very strong hierarchy here, right? And it goes very much from the abstract to the concrete. And that's, that's relevant because I have, throughout this project, always maintained that we have to go bottom up. We have to focus on, if we want to make any improvement here, this jungle is so thick. Lexon is really, really focused on smart contracts, which is basically even below the, the contracts, right? It's even, even one level below that if you want, but it's tapping, it's, it's, it's tapping into the whole section of contracts there. Lexon was not created even for regulations or for law or for constitution, but I'll come back to that because as I suspected, if you get the lowest layer right, then you start to be able to feel your way the layers up. And 
I think many people in the space will know uh, Meng Wong and uh, legalese. He is really trying it from top down. And we basically agreed maybe we will manage to meet in the middle. Um, but there's really two very different ways to look at it. And I was very pragmatic, very much the software developer uh, um, uh, fear of, of losing, losing focus, uh, not getting anywhere if you don't focus on, on solving just a very pragmatic thing. And that very pragmatic thing are smart contracts, smart contracts, right? That's, that's what we focus on. Um, every contract you enter into basically is, makes your life more complicated, right? Because you add more rules. Well, if you do this, right, actually, even if you talk, even if you don't talk about smart contracts and programmers that you have to trust then, if you're not yourself a programmers, programmer, otherwise you also ask to ask a trust special, specialist, right? Lawyers, judges, arbitrators, whoever they are. But shouldn't that all be simpler too, right? And with blockchain, there's this additional shift in, um, in powers because if blockchain is adapted in the legal profession, then what will happen in a way is that a lot of work will shift away from litigation to the lawyer side of it. A lot of work will shift towards getting the contracts right because in some sense, they cannot go wrong later, right? They will perform as written. So on the whole, you would probably see less contracts being taken to court and more work being put in to get the contract right up front. It also means that some of the executive power is actually shifted towards lawyers. Um, because obviously, the, 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 if the smart contract is self-executing, uh, if it's self-enforcing, uh, and, and there's a debate whether that's a, that's a good way to, to, to call it that way, but you are shifting a power away from what is usually the executive branch, right? And again, if you do this, then you better you better know what is actually um, happening there. So. Before I go on with these slides here, um, I would like to um, show you how this how this looks. Or actually, jump ahead a little bit, um, because we have um, yeah, this is remix, and uh, I have I, I will now try to um, to show you live um, how you can uh, enable remix. That's the that's an alpha. It's the upcoming. It's the alpha version. And um, one of the uh, plugins that now exists is, uh, is Lexon. So um, when, you, when you click it, basically you get the Lexon um, plugin activated here. And now um, you can use Remix to enter Lexon code. Um, and this is an example of what I've been talking about all along. It's a very simple, I'm just formatting it here uh, as a, <laughs> and and this is uh, something where um, it's just a very simple escrow contract, and um, I will kind of go through the individual lines what it actually does, just to make sure you guys still hear me. All's good. All's good. All's good. We're following along. Awesome. Okay. Cool. So. Lexon code always starts with a lex. Um, that is a keyword that will, of course, kind of break the immersion rate. Right? Lexon can be implemented into normal contract pros. At some point, then you will bump into this keyword lex, and after that, you will um, have a clear marker. Okay, this is now where the automated part starts. This is stuff that we didn't just invent, right? We've been talking about this a lot with lawyers who are in this space. Uh, wouldn't it be nicer to not even have that, to have full transparency and so on? But that's one of these things where if you look at it, how it will really be used, um, it will never be used in the sense that something is just completely transparent and nobody has to, not at, least at this point, right? And even if you have a long contract of 100 pages that is just normal prose, and then you have this automated part within it, it's, it's just going to be helpful that it's very clear where the automation starts, even though you can uh, at a later version of Lexon, we'll be able to, to freely mix uh, code and, and, and normal prose. Lexon's just going to recognize if there's a sentence that it cannot parse, it is going to accept it as, um, 
as, as a command, basically. So um, then the next the next line here, and oh, and then what you have here, paid escrow, that's basically just the name, it's just the, the file name, if you want, of this, uh, of this script. You have a tag that you can use to, um, uh, to give a version number that might be important because obviously right now we're at, point, at 0 0.2, it, there's a lot of stuff that works, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work yet. And if I have time, I will uh, show you uh, the, the 0 0.3 grammar a little later. You have a command here, and then it starts, right? So, and this is actually the definition part. We're defining four nouns here, basically. That's how in Lexon parlance we, we call this pair, payee, arbiter, and fee. And all we know at this point, because what we're really doing is uh, for a programmer, that's, uh, that's clear, right? It was just basically declaring types. Declare, we're declaring variables and types. What I've learned how normal people look at this, they have to be explained very often that this is actually a template, right? But because because actually what they would expect here is payer is, uh, and then a name, and then a street address. Uh, uh, so to be very clear that who this person is, but lawyers are of course also used to reusing contracts. And one of the very interesting findings while developing this is that Actually, it can really help to not go towards the abstraction. But what lawyers actually do is they not necess don't necessarily work with templates. They just copy paste and then change stuff, right? So the tools that we will create for for this will um, actually happen to be closer to that and a little further away from being a template. And also, we are <laughs> changing the. Uh, changing the syntax at this point, because we found that actually, if you write it this way, it's obviously uh, very much the same, but it's clearer. Well, you're, type, you're, you're, you're typing and, and just reducing what everybody else would, would enter that's relevant to them in the local context to the function. You're just mapping, you're just mapping uh, that to the function, which is payer, essentially. No, um, what I'm doing here is actually, uh, I mean, I, I basically, uh, I'm giving a um, outlook how uh, we are, how the, the syntax of Lexon is evolving while we're trying to make it even easier to understand for non-programmers, right? And what I was just presenting was how we will change the syntax to make it because we found if you, if you write it this way, then programmers understand this right away. If you write it this way, then non-programmers find it much easier to understand. That's what I wanted to get at, that we're still making it better, making it easier for non-programmers to understand because the very concept of a template is something that is not that does not go without saying, right? But it's you're helping people if you if you if you extend the syntax like this. So this is where we where we will where we're going towards. If I go back to what we have here right now, right? It's a very, it's a very simple, very clear declaration block here, and then we know basically, okay, we have a variable as we programmers call it, that's a pair. We have a variable that's a payee. We have an arbiter. We have a fee. Then we have something as programmers we would call this constructor. As as lawyers, um, people would call this um, uh, the preamble. No, I'm sorry. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure if we call it preamble or what, what we call it at this point. That's also a contribution from a lawyer, um, how this should be called from, uh, from the lawyer side, but um, I have to look it up. Anyway, so what happens here is pretty obvious. In this very simple example, we are um, basically saying, okay, so let's let the payer set it all up. If the payee doesn't like it, they're just not going to accept it. But the, in this case, we just say, okay, the payer pays the amount into escrow and appoints the payee and appoints the arbiter and fixes the fee, right? And what happens with this actually, it also, it's already on track to be something that's actually safer than something you would do in the real world, right? Especially if it's a lot of money. What we're setting up here is with a smart contract, of course, something where the money is not going to be, the arbiter is not going to be able to just take the money and run, right? There's no, there's no one you have to trust except of the blockchain. And that's for blockchain people, that's clear. That's obvious, right? But for non-blockchain people, for lawyers, that's not quite clear necessarily. 
that we are now already entering the space where uh, we are having a benefit right here because we can we can be safe in the assumption that money that that is being paid in can only go to the payee later or to the payer and of course the clauses here are going to um, make this uh, spell this out so after the after the um, preamble or the, the constructor we now have a clause and of course for programmers it's clear that's a function right now especially especially for smart contracts we always have this um, uh, a smart contract doesn't do anything on its own, basically, right? And we understand that a function has to be called. How we do this on the legal side is basically that everything or, or much here revolves around the word may. Because what we're expressing here in rather easy to understand English is that this is an option. This clause that there could be a payout is defined by something the arbiter may do. And we are leaving open, and we also had a lot of debate there with lawyers. Um, we're, la we're leaving open whether the arbiter is actually going to do it or not. And of course, you could you could easily think of a version of this um, script that is going to have the arbiter stake something up front, or have the arbiter um, get, uh, getting um, getting punished if if uh, if they don't do their job. However, what we do here is just like, if they don't do this, then they also don't get their fee. They don't even have to be staked. They are staked. They're hopefully incentivized by the um, payee um, putting, in, uh, putting in the fee uh, that they will actually do what they're supposed to do. This is a major difference. That is not something that this language here is, is bringing to the blockchain, but that is just how smart contracts work. Right, and this language just puts it in very, um, it makes it very clear, and that's often the point where, when uh, when we're presenting to to lawyers, there where the discussion re revolves around. There is, meanwhile, though, I mean, what is um, happening in law, especially in common law, like in uh, in America and in, in uh, Great Britain, is that the idea that contracts should not be broken is basically relegated to the dustbin of history. Because what the theory now becomes is that if somebody is willing to pay the lost profits to their contracting partner, then they should actually be allowed to walk away. They just pay the other party out. And if they feel even after that, they better off if they break the contract, then they should be allowed to break it. And the language that we still have in contracts to this day is something that is a religious um, artifact, where in the past there was an oath being sworn or whatever it is. So if you go into a contract, you promise that's what you're gonna do, then hellfire basically awaits um, as an additional uh, punishment if you break a contract. But that's well, as not- a German, As a German speaker, uh, you're very familiar with the difference between the word schuld that uh, in German and how it is that we use it in English. It has that moral religious component of, uh, of obligation yeah, to obey that we separate between debt yeah, and schuld. Yeah, they're two different things in English. And yeah. But you, you'd be surprised that actually in German, it's uh, it actually religion took it from business. Not business from religion. Yes, yes, yes. No, I'm familiar with that. But it's a very different. It's a very uh, different distinction in the two languages. Yes, but it but it makes it even clearer how um, where contracts are coming from. And actually, in common law, you uh, in 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 civil um, law jurisdiction, you still have this um, you still have this uh, dictum of pacta sunt servanda, right? It's it's a it's a basic tenet of law that uh, contracts should be um, uh, fulfilled. But this doesn't actually exist in common law. And also the, the idea that contracts, to, for something to be a contract, it must be fair, that's much less pronounced in, in the uh, Anglo-Saxon space where the idea is not necessarily that a judge should be obliged to understand whether a deal would have been fair would, uh, if these and that conditions would have been kept. Point here is, that the terminology of may of, of shall and must and should that is usually used in a contract and which 
problematically implies a deontic type of logic, which has a huge problem in that it's not really, uh, it doesn't have a good arithmetic. It doesn't, uh, it's not easy to calculate with, is actually something that doesn't, is not actually used anymore. It's not actually the reality of contracts anymore. And there is a resistant resistance that's very understandable from lawyers to go away from shall and must and how contracts are written today. But the reality is actually that this is also ripe for disruption, right? Of course, now that's 2,000 years, 2,000 years old, um, uh, grown um, a language, though so you cannot expect for this to go away anytime soon. But the reality is that blockchain has evolved the way it has very much um, with a business-oriented thinking. And you could even think blockchain might have evolved differently if reputation was still something that would take a hit if you break a contract, but that's not the case. Reputation systems are a staple of uh, blockchain projects and are very, going to be have a, play a very important role in a lot of concepts of blockchain, but they're not in the built into the deepest layer. And maybe they were if that was still how we see contracts, but we just don't. And so what Lexon is um, showing very clearly and making it human readable is that um, contracts at this point um, should maybe be articul articulated more with everything being optional. Because if we do this, every smart contract basically can incorporate what the happy path for a breach is. And then there's no breach of the breach, right? Because of the smart contract. So that's that's going very far here and why um, and what how lawyers actually look at this, how they actually um, uh, take it up, um, what the actual challenges are in, in uh, making this palatable and making this uh, usable and thinkable for um, for real business situations. Um, for for the language itself, the funny thing is that when I present this to lawyers, like I have another example that's that's a will. Um, and it was so funny. I was I was presenting this to um, professors of law at the University of uh, at the UCLA, and and a, and a discussion erupted immediately about how the smart contract was not really a will and it doesn't really work that way and so on. And of course, what's completely overlooked in that moment is that well, this language just serves for you as a lawyer to be able to have this discussion. So you're just, obviously you're just proving, thank you very much, it completely works because you have, you have an opinion about the logic of the contract that I'm putting on the screen that in your opinion has to be done differently because the way that it's expressed here is not really well and so on, but that's complete, that's the legal level, right? And the power of what I've presented is basically, okay, so, you can now, as a lawyer, within seconds, jump in and have an opinion in the first place, so to say, and go and say, well, uh, I think this is stupid. Or you can say, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's exactly how it can and how it should, should work. So, so to argue it, so to argue it at that point, I would at the grammar level, which is embedded in the, in the code, not after the fact, essentially. Make, make your arguments here about what, what's used to be expressed in the smart contract grammar. Or I, no, I, the I, point I, is that a lawyer, a lawyer can look at a smart contract and immediately say something about its content within seconds. We didn't have that before. And that's all I'm, that's all I'm bringing to the table with this thing, right? Usually if you would show them a solidity contract, they wouldn't have an opinion about it. If you show them a Lexon contract, you can immediately have a discussion about the content. That's the point. Don't tell me that was not clear. <laughs> yes, it, it, it is clear. I, I, I'm just, uh, I was maybe expressing it in a, in a different way. Yeah. No, maybe I'm blind, blinded by um, uh, what I think I'm saying. But um, uh, yeah, so the thing is though, the, the fun thing about it is how easily that is overlooked, right? Because what happens in the situation is that somebody is uh, getting a little angry about the bullshit I'm showing on screen, but I'm like, yeah, well, it's uh, awesome that you're getting angry, but actually the point is one point before that, right? You jumped right over it. And that's how transparent it is. But that's also why I like this, this slide here. Where basically we can say, okay, so 
this collapsing of two worlds, like of programming and of the legal world, is actually when you think through it, it's it's amazingly powerful. Um, you're cutting out like in like in the real world, like in the business world, in the bricks of mortar um, commer commerce that that is really happening, where people don't care a lot about blockchain or crypto or anything. They got to get their work done. There's a way to get it done. And yes, we're all, there's always um, interest in, in making it more productive and so on. But the amount of stuff that you can cut out when you can really use smart contracts with everything that we like about it, like that they cannot be broken, that they are safe. Um, and combine that with human language so that when people write something and they can read it and they can find the errors themselves, or they can double check whether what has been implemented by programmers, it might still be programmers programming it, right? Well, it's the, um, it's the, it's the Gutenberg uh, Bible argument, essentially, taking taking interpretation out of out of the hands of the high priesthood. And I exactly. would think that, that exactly this sentence, I just look at that, and I just like the bells and whistles go off, you know, for, you know, it's just the trigger term without divine interpreters. So I can, and, and, and so you're proposing to lawyers that, hey, uh, interpretation is not supposed to happen after the fact. Opinion is supposed to happen at the base layer, yeah? That we can that, put a, that, is, that is what blockchain is proposing, right? Uh, yeah. This one is just inviting the lawyers to the table if you want, right? Yeah. Because yes, you could all do this now, but you have to have lawyers and programmers working together and this is all made so much more productive that it really reaches a new quality, right? And what happens in a certain sense is that I like this image of um, you basically have um, you, usually a contract in the past was something you write and then you put it in your draw and hopefully you never have to take it out because everything in the real world happens exactly like the contract um, uh, was written and then nobody has to go to court or do anything with it, right? Now, smart contracts are the opposite, right? Smart contracts are actually the, they're actually driving the thing itself, right? It's like what you write, you write that in plain English and then you don't put it in the draw anymore, but instead it's the program that actually runs what you wrote as exactly as written. And that is really a new type and it's a new quality, it's a new way of doing business that is, that is about to commence there, right? We're just starting out. But this is, this is going to be so powerful that that it will um, it will um, put some aspects of of our lives in overdrive and it will maybe make it uh, normal that if you write a contract about stuff that you would now not think about writing a contract because you could never enforce it right you can never take anybody to court nor would you want to because you, you don't want the social friction of that right but if you put it in a smart contract then well yeah it's going to happen right and that's going to make so many things so much more productive and it will. It, it might put so much strive to rest because you don't have to, you know, squabble about, oh, I meant it this way, or I meant it this way. You just, you don't even have to go back to what was written because it's just happening, right? And this is something that's pretty unimaginable still at this point, I would say. And it is, in fact, um, very similar. Well, no, no, no. I don't know that I, I, I so agree uh, with you at that point. I think that, sure. right. I think that immutability is the thing that scares uh, people the most about blockchain. It's exactly what you see in finance. I mean, the whole yeah. transaction per second, uh, you know, discussion scaling debate centers around the fact that that <clears throat> in the in the world that we have now, transactions are reversible based on a mediator. And just as as you know, financial inst legacy financial institutions freak the fuck out over immutability. It's the same issue for 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 legal yeah that yeah. inability it, we're messy people and we want to argue about stuff and we want to change our opinion you know yes and but this is this is uh, this is what i said in the beginning i'm this is where my virtual machine building uh, side comes in and yes that's also something that has to be addressed in my view and i have a very clear concept how i want to address that it's not what i'm going to present today but i completely agree I couldn't agree more. It's the it's the it's the puzzle piece that also has to be solved for this to be take off. But it's just not in the language, right? So today let's focus on the language. Um, but yes, um, 
it's it's very much um, what is what also has to be addressed, and it can be addressed in my view, right? Um, I'll just show you what I'm showing here right now is this will, um, where it's also just a very simple, uh, very short contract, right? And this is just where um, just for you to um, see the actual example. This is where. Uh, you can have a discussion about about the contents and why maybe is it, is, it is a bad example like because it's legally is not going to work or in some jurisdictions it will and some others it won't and so on but you can't have that example if you just put a solidity code in front of a lawyer right and it's hard for us to understand sometimes because solidity is so readable but then if you go a little deeper and i'm i'm just going to jump there in a, in a second uh, you find out that actually it's not um it's it is something different um, when you translate logic into a program language. Uh, what I wanted to show is basically this. I mean, the, the, the metaphor here is really like the, the letters themselves um, are now coming to life in a way that um, before, basically, we didn't expect that. And it was even not maybe exactly what I was going for because um, I was, as I said, very focused on smart contracts and I was very focused on um, just even making them safer, basically, by adding um, that they also transfer ownership to the miracle that they are in themselves, that they can transfer possession, right? So, but what came out of it, basically, is this machine where it became clear that when we have this parser in the middle and a virtual machine and a transpiler, then we can use different natural languages and we have looked at um a japanese uh we, we tr tried to do whether this can work in japanese yes it can um super excited about that of course i experimented whether it can actually work in, in german uh, we might uh, experiment with, with um with uh dutch next and what Lexon also can do is uh and that's that's something uh, i was also wanting to show uh, real quick uh, it can, we can, can also use it to uh, translate it to different languages, uh, di different blockchain. So um, this is this is basically the um, the online editor for the um, uh, for Eternity blockchain, and Eternity yeah, um, love, has a beautiful love, language you know, built there. Parallel to Polis, we're totally stoked about yeah. Sophia yeah. and Sherpy as well. Yeah, yeah. it's. It's so awesome, but it's certainly not really, I mean, it's so elegant and everything. I love it. Um, but it is not necessarily um, human readable in the sense that Lexon is human readable, right? And so we have created, I don't, I don't, I'm not actually sure whether this version uh, would work, but we, we will have something online where we will, um, where Lexon can be compiled with um, just, it should be in here actually. Um, so let me just jump in one last second. Okay. So we're actually at the end of your talk time, but the next person mm -hmm. doesn't start until until uh, uh, in ten minutes. So we should mm -hmm. sort of sort of wrap it up in 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 the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. If there's a fine some final points that so, you want to make. Or... Yeah, thank you very much. So. Um... There, there's a book out there um, where I'm explaining everything. There's, there's even another book where I'm explaining it even longer. Um, I'm uh, basically touching upon um, a lot of questions. I'm going a little deeper on, on a lot of questions, like pragmatic questions that are um, that are about okay. So how can this actually be put to use, or what is what is the um, uh, the trajectory from uh, from just the theory or what we have here now towards something that that you can really see in practice at some point um we're also working on um the next uh, level of the grammar uh, let's just just want to show how this looks right where the grammar that we have right now does some nice things it's not the cleanest than uh, the next iteration which is something i was uh, always uh, very excited about um to push the whole thing even closer to human language also and how it's internally working. And the book also explains a little bit about how the abstract syntax tree works, which is something that every compiler has uh, built up internally, and how this abstract mm -hmm. syntax tree is even looking more like normal grammar. It's, it's looking more like something 
like how we speak. And it, it's also making the point how we are basically, um, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, have two different um, ideas about it. It was There was this um, old way of thinking about artificial intelligence where basically the hope was that you would have sentient computers in the end. Right now, we're more looking at big data and, and finding patterns in data that are just too complex, that are super valuable, but too complex for human beings to even understand, let alone have words for. But that the way that Lexon actually processes data is maybe a new surprising kind of having output that also is not sentient, right? It's not processed on the level that there's any intelligence then in the computer that is reasoning about it. But because what Lexon does keeps so much intact of what the original sentence structure was, you can create output from it that's really surprisingly close to something that makes sense for a human being without the computer having to actually understand it on the road there. But it can process it because to implement rules, obviously you do not have to understand what you're doing, right? So even if the computer doesn't understand what it does and also big data, number crunching, machine learning, the computer doesn't really understand what it, what it does, right? There are rules and they're being applied. And Nexon is a very interesting way to use the original programming tools like Lex and Yak and, and stuff that's been invented in the, in the uh, 50s and 60s um, to, to basically describe and implement algo. And we're using them in a way instead of compiling a artificial math-like grammar of a program language, like it usually happens, we're using it and point it back to a subset of natural language. That's called, that's called controlled language. And I've looked at papers meanwhile, because I wondered, I was always sure this must exist outside the blockchain space somewhere, somehow this is done. But there are papers actually that also wonder about why it, is, it has not been done uh, to the extent yet that we're that we're showing here. And in a way, the focus remains for us on blockchain and, and legal, but it has become clear. It has application for doing business logic, implementing business flow in companies, in for doing stuff that for DAOs that are not interested in the legal side of it, but just interested that their members can read it. And it really Penny. has turned out. Penny. Yes, Penny. Um, in 30 seconds. It has turned out that um, the the actual um, the actual realm that is opened up here is that of a program language that humans can understand. And that is obviously much bigger than smart contracts that lawyers can understand. And that is the very exciting journey that this all started. And uh, we're right in the middle of it at this point. And if somebody is interested, then get in touch with me. I'd be super happy um, to um, uh, talk more about it. Um, and if you want, if you're interested to contribute, that would be awesome. Um, you find all the information on the website and the, and the books, and uh, the books are also still work in progress. So if you read it, please send me your feedback, and that's it for right now.